So what happens when we have an equilibrium system and we want to either add or remove substances to or from this system? How can we analyze and explain the things that happen? Well, there's this really important principle that, that really explains quite effectively this situation. We call this Le Chatelier's principle. And this principle states that if we have a chemical system that is at equilibrium, then if we if we change the system in any way, then that system will oppose the change that we make. So for example, we might add a product to this uh, this reaction here. So we've got a reaction or an equilibrium system involving substances A, B, C, and D. And all of these substances are at equilibrium. There is no net reaction occurring. Now if we add extra C, then we apply Le Chatelier's principle. If we add extra, then this principle states that our chemical system, our chemical equilibrium, will oppose the change. So it will oppose the fact that we've added extra of substance C. And the way that it opposes that is it gets rid of some of that extra C that we added. And so if it's getting rid of some of that extra C, it's going to undergo a net back reaction. So we add extra of substance C, and the Chatelier's principle tells us that the equilibrium system will then use up some of that extra C that we've added by, under, by, uh, by allowing a net backwards reaction to occur. So if we add extra C, it means that this, we're going we're to have a net back reaction, so we're going to have more A and B being produced. If there's a net back reaction, then that means we're using up D as well as C, so there's going to be less substance D. However, this is where the word partially comes in. The system states that the, the principle states that the system will partially oppose this change. It will partially get rid of the extra substance C that's been added, but it won't get rid of all of it. It'll get rid of some. So if we add one mole of substance C, then half a mole of that might get used up in the back reaction, and therefore half a mole of D will also get used up. But we'll still end up with half a mole more than we started with. So we're still going to end up with more C than we started with, the more C than we had before we added anything. So that is what happens. Now we can also analyze this rather than just using this principle, we can analyze it using our concentration fraction or our equilibrium concept, constant. So we know that because the system was at equilibrium, the, con the equilibrium constant was equal to the concentration fracture, fraction. And this was equal to concentration of C times concentration of D over concentration of E times the concentration of B. And so this, let's say the equilibrium constant of this reaction is equal to K1. Now, if we've added extra C, that means the concentration of C has gone up. We're assuming that adding extra C hasn't changed the volume of our, of our equilibrium system. So all these concentrations remained the same initially, but we had extra C. So the concentration of substance C was higher. That meant the, that the concentration fraction, after we'd added extra C, was greater than our equilibrium constant. So the concentration fraction had to decrease back down. Uh, it had to, some of substance C and D had to react away, and some of substance A and B had to uh, be produced in order to decrease the concentration fraction and make it equal to K1. So that's how we can analyze it using, uh, using our concentration fraction. Now it's also important to be aware that if we're removing some of substance C, if we could, if we wanted to remove some substance C, then again the system could oppose this change. If we decrease the amount of substance C, then the system would oppose this by producing some extra substance C to replace the stuff that we took away, and so we'd see a net forwards reaction. So that can be that's a very useful way for us to uh, to really ensure that we're using up all of our reactants is by removing our products in a reaction. If we're removing C and D, then it means that we're going to keep using up A and B until it's all gone. Now, lastly, it's very important that we realize that these changes are proportional. If we have, for example, a 2 here, and using the example earlier, we add, we add 1 mole of C, and we'll say 0 0.5 mole of C is reacted away. That means that 0 0.5 mole of C, mole of A, sorry, will be produced. A is produced, 
one mole of B will be produced and one mole and again 0 0.5 mole of D will be reacted away. So it's just like straightforward stoichiometry. However, the reason that this is important is that we want to be able to graph the way that our concentrations change when we alter our system. So, if we were to draw a graph of the concentration of concentration versus time. So if we have concentration on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis. Then, if we start, if we say that we have our concentration of A here, our initial concentration, B here, C here, and D here, and let's say that initially they're all constant like this. Now, we remove some of substance C, so there's a quick drop in the concentration of substance C. Then, the system reacts to this by partially opposing, by producing some more C, however, not enough, so, however, it doesn't produce enough such that the concentration gets the same as what it was. It produces slightly less than that, so it comes down to it's slightly lower. The concentration of C increases, but remains lower than its initial value. So we see something like this. So that's how much C increases by, because D has the same coefficient. It's going to increase by the same amount. However, B has the value of 2 there. So we know that the, uh, because there's a net forward reaction, there's production of C and D, concentrations of A and B will decrease, and B will decrease by twice as much. So B will decrease like that, and A will increase slightly like that. And so we can see that this distance here is twice the value of these distances. So each of these distances is half. Each of these changes is half the change that we see in B. So if we want to look at an example of how we can draw this graph up, just make some space. Then what we're going to look at is we're going to look at the production of sulfur trioxide. So the production of sulfur trioxide has an equation that looks like this. So what happens when we add one mole of sulfur dioxide? Now, we can, obviously, we can see that a net forward reaction will occur. However, we're going to draw this graphically. So what we, what we have is, again, concentration versus time. So we've got concentration versus time. We've got our sulfur dioxide up the top here. So we'll do sulfur dioxide in red. We'll do our oxygen in yellow. And we'll do our sulfur trioxide in blue. Now what happens? So we're adding one mole of sulfur dioxide. So that means there's going to be a spike in the concentration of sulfur dioxide, so we'll just colour code more clearly. So there's going to be a spike in the concentration of sulfur dioxide, like so. It's going to be a, a sudden and immediate increase, and then because of that, the system will oppose this change and react away some sulfur dioxide. However, again, it will only partially react away the sulfur dioxide. It, there will still be more sulfur dioxide than we had initially, so we're going to see something like this. So we can see that here, the, the value at which the concentration of sulfur dioxide plateaus and remains constant is higher than it was what it was before. So we've added some sulfur dioxide and we've reacted away most of what we added. Now, because there's a net forward reaction, that means oxygen will also be used up. However, the change in the concentration of oxygen will be half the change in the concentration of sulfur dioxide. So whereas sulfur dioxide decreased by this much, Oxygen should only decrease by half as much, by, by this much here. So we'll, we'll see a drop because there's a forward reaction. So this is what we see. The oxygen concentration of oxygen decreases, but by half as much as the concentration of sulfur dioxide. Then we have sulfur trioxide. Again, sulfur trioxide only has a 1 in front of it. So we're going to see a, a change in half the... Uh, a change that is half the size of the change in sulfur dioxide, or a change that is the same size as that of oxygen, 
but this change is going to be an increase. So we're going to have an increase here. And this increase here is going to be the same size as this decrease. So we see something like this. So that is how we can draw the graph of concentration versus time. Now, this is quite a simplistic version because there's no crisscrossing of lines. We don't have any of our lines crisscrossing. However, in reality, the, the concentrations are likely to be a lot closer together, maybe swapping, maybe the lines crossing each other. And so it can be very helpful for us to spread them out along the vertical axis like this, just to increase the clarity of things a little bit. But what we're seeing is that a sudden increase and then a, a drop, a gradual drop in concentration of sulfur dioxide, a drop by half as much in the concentration of oxygen, and an increase by, again, half as much in the, in the concentration of sulfur trioxide. So that's how we can draw a graph using Le Chatelier's principle on what happens when we add or remove reactants.